It is an event and venue that transcends even the sport that brought it worldwide prominence. Where beauty intersects seamlessly with the power of competition at the highest level. Where players can enter as mortals but leave as legends. From the beginning, Augusta National and the Masters has had its own unique style, anchored in the strength of substance that has stood the test of time. He's got a fitting climax. Every spring, both of those qualities come together to create an event unlike any other in the world. It's the Masters, Substance of Style. Hello everyone, I'm Bill McAtee. The vision for the Augusta National Golf Club by Bobby Jones, Dr. Alistair McKenzie, and Clifford Roberts was grand and complex. Augusta National was an infusion of their knowledge, sophistication, and masterful understanding of the intricacies of the game of golf. The breathtaking physical elegance of the colorful display of its dogwoods and azaleas, its perfectly manicured greens and rolling fairways, the brilliance of Mother Nature's palette, but its beauty cloaks subtle complexities that provides golf's ultimate chessboard. Since it began in 1934, the world has watched as players, styles, and even the game have all changed. The one constant has been the event itself. Without question, it has been a memorable journey. One that all started with a man many consider to be the greatest player of all time and occurs in a place of remarkable beauty. When I first drove into Augusta, it was like walking out into heaven. It's, it's pretty spectacular. It's pristine. Arnold Palmer is the Masters champion. It's the same feeling today as I had in 1959. Such a historic place. It just has this incredible feel and vibe to it. I was able to be there on Saturday and Sunday before the tournament when there were no spectators. It was just serene. I mean, it was unbelievable. Just quiet. When you get to Race Creek, you can hear the water running. It really just exemplified heaven on earth for me. When you first go to Augusta, I always tell people, the first thing you're going to notice is how beautiful it is. It's just incredibly beautiful. The second thing you're going to notice is how green everything is. The idea that it's organically beautiful, that the hills, the greenery, the flowering shrubs, it's its own fashion show in nature. You have the impression from television that it's a walk in a botanical garden. You know, the holes are named juniper, firethorn, tea olive. Oh, a gentle stroll through a park. Yeah. Because it's only afterwards you'll realize that you've been on a route march. The course is not flat. The course is actually fairly hilly. You'd have to be there to see how difficult it is, how there's not a level lie on the whole golf course. Whether it's walking off the T1 or coming up the 18th hole or going down the 10th fairway, there is an amazing amount of drop of elevation. The course's elevation changes often surprise first-time visitors. Just one of the many elements that force a player during the heat of competition to adapt, be creative, and think their way around the course. There's just more imagination involved. It actually plays more similar to playing something like St. Andrews than it does an American golf course with the imagination you have to have around that place. Bob Jones wanted to let the land speak for itself, but he wanted to present problems that made people think on the golf course. He said, I want to exercise your mind. Plus, there's the history. Every year, they come back to the same course. And so you know the history of past shots. That ball is dead on the flag. A sensational shot, five inches from the cup. And so when somebody does something uh, memorable, it's like, oh, that reminds me of this. But this is, that's one of the greatest putts I've ever seen. So that reminds me of that. Uh, It just lends more of a story to it all. Some of those golf holes become part of the family. Clean contact. And it's unbelievable. 
Beautiful shot by Nicholson. It become old French. And you look to see every time you go back if there's anything changed. Both Jones and McKenzie were extremely well educated. Jones, one of the game's greatest players, studied mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech, English literature at Harvard, and law at Emory. While McKenzie, one of its most sophisticated course architects, was a surgeon who learned the art of military camouflage during the Boer War. The combination was formidable. In the early days when they were building the course, Jones actually got out on the course. Uh, and there's a very famous picture of him on the eighth hole. You can, you can tell it's the eighth hole, it's all dirt, and the hole is, is cut in, and he's driving a ball to see where they're gonna land shots. I mean, it was, it was a very interesting way of building the course. Jones set out to do a seaside golf course on an inland property, and there's a lot of seaside characteristics to Augusta. At the time Augusta National was built, there was nothing like it. Extremely spacious fairways, big, large, rolling greens to remind people from, about St. Andrews. The old course was its inspiration, but the course they created in Georgia was an original. And as the game has evolved, Augusta National and the tournament have too. It's been that ability to maintain the style and integrity of the course, which helps keep the fabric of the Masters traditions intact. People will sometimes say when the club makes a change in the golf course, they're, oh, you know, they're defacing a masterpiece. Mackenzie and Jones would be rolling in their graves. But actually that course has been a work in progress since the day it was completed in 1931. The aerial view shows a low tee up through a pine tree opening and then an opening on the left. However, the flag today is cut to the front left portion of the green. They've always thought of it that way. Jones described the course as being of national design. The club has always taken ideas from lots and lots of people. Augusta's done a, just a beautiful job of staying one step ahead of advances in equipment by lengthening the course, putting some rough in, putting some trees in, and still keep the integrity of the holes and the integrity of the tournament. The shots that I played into the holes when I was playing in the 60s are relatively the same clubs the guys play into the greens today. Because they've adjusted the way they've adjusted the golf course and it plays relatively the same. Bobby Jones helped shape the style of his era. It was the time of the Great Depression. F. Scott Fitzgerald, Fred Astaire, and Bobby Jones. While Jones rose to unparalleled heights in the game, he also set the tone in establishing a style we've come to expect at the Masters. Jones was a gentleman, and he shaped the image of the game. He came to exemplify the game. People who played golf wanted to be like him. He really did establish the template for the modern sportsmanship, but certainly in golf. Men's clothing icon Joseph Abood studied the Jones style early in his career as a designer for the Bobby Jones collection. His style within the game was so powerful that we have those images today. And if we looked at style icons today, he would be one of them. In the 1940s, it was the flashy and talented Texan Jimmy DeMeritt who brought his unique personality and sartorial splendor to the fairways of Augusta. DeMeritt eventually became the first three-time winner of the Masters, claiming victories in 1940, 47, and 1950. The clothing I learned from DeMeritt, they wore gabardine slacks. It had a particular thing about it. It had a very sharp crease in the trousers. So I decided that that's the kind of slacks that I wanted to wear. Jimmy DeMeritt was kind of the clown prince of golf. He was famous for his colorful antics and his uh, purple pantaloons and big floppy hat. He was also a performer. DeMeritt's good friend in the early days was Ben Hogan. In the 1950s, Hogan won the Masters twice. He was revered for his exceptional ball striking, relentless work ethic, and his steely, focused, on-course demeanor. They called him the Hawk 
because he looked like a hawk and he was as fierce as a hawk and if you didn't understand golf or know what he was all about he didn't have any time for you but if you knew the game if you could play the game he knew you understood what he was about and he respected that he wanted to be very precise in everything he did and that included how he dressed business gray was his color that was a reflection of his admiration for businessmen and how they led their lives with his first masters win in 1951 hogan became only the third player to be formally awarded the green jacket a tradition that began in 1949 when the stylish man from virginia with the silky swing sam sneed captured the first of his three masters victories Snee was an immaculate dresser. Like Hogan, he decided that how you looked uh, was at least as important almost as how you played. Sam Snead had a great personality. He was always joking. He'd always say, feel that arm. Pow! Man, he was like a piece of steel. He'd walk in the room at 65. Pow! Kick the top of the door. Uh, amazing man. The master substance of style will return. When the Masters was first televised in the mid-50s, players' on-course personalities, along with their significant skills, were there for the world to see. And leading the way was a man whose smile and charisma seemed to jump off the screen and into our living rooms. The King had arrived. What a charismatic man. He fell out of bed with charisma. He's colorful, he's funny, he looks good in the clothes he wears. He dragged the game into the modern era with his pants an inch too short and the biceps showing and that beautiful smile. He made the hair stand up in every man's arms. He made the game sexy. I guess you couldn't have gone to central casting and found a better player than Arnold Palmer. He looked the part. He was a rugged American. He had style. And of course, he had a great game. Arnie's success, especially at the Masters, combined with his charm, and good looks also changed the business of style. He became the perfect corporate partner. And when Jack Nicholas arrived, they may not have realized it, but two powerful brands were being formed. I was not one to think about it myself as a brand. I just knew that, that I loved what I was doing. I never worried much about endorsements or anything else when I was playing in my early years. When I look back, I actually was building a brand, not realizing that myself. And when you become a brand, you need a logo. Mark McCormick and his organization, when they joined me, we started looking for a logo. There was nothing available, nothing that reminded you of golf. And we were having a meeting about that. And it was raining that day, and this lady got out of her car. She put an umbrella up, and it was a multicolored umbrella. And I thought, boy, that might be good. And we put together an umbrella with various colors on it. Each represented a division of her company. Arnold endorsed a lot more things than I did. My people, I told them, guys, I want to do just a little bit. I don't want to do much. But what I want to do is something that is lasting. Jack nailed it with the golden bed. You can build a brand around it. Jack Nicholas or a Golden Bear because you have a great looking logo. In the 1980s and 90s, it was the play and style of a young Aussie that demanded the limelight. And as he became a force, ultimately as the number one player in the game, the Shark knew the timing was right. I started Great White Shark Enterprises. My nickname was the Great White Shark, so here we come with the logo. I learned, I learned from Arnold. I learned from Jack. They probably didn't know what they were teaching me. I just learned. Like Arnie and Jack before them, Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson arrived with different approaches to the game and different personalities. Tiger was a, an incredibly hot property. He was going to be an international star. There was a sense he was going to create an explosion in golf. While Tiger played his way into a brand, Phil Mickelson has followed the Arnold Palmer template accessible and friendly. He was equally at home interacting with galleries and corporate leaders. The new generation of players who grew up watching Phil and Tiger know that while the foundation of the game may be the same, the look 
has definitely changed. And this generation has also learned from those who have gone before them. It's cool to watch them both in different ways and to understand that there isn't one way to do it. You gotta find what works for you. More of the Masters Substance of Style when we return. Golfers select their own wardrobes, unlike most professional athletes, which often is a reflection of their personalities. In the early days of the game, the typical attire was more formal and perhaps less comfortable. It wasn't until the 1940s and 50s when golf clothing started to evolve. Ties were replaced by cardigans, and golf style became a bit more sporty, if only in a Sunday afternoon kind of way. Then came the 1970s. It was an appalling time for fashion. There's no question about that. Everything comes back into fashion, they say, you know, but not so much the 70s, thankfully. <laughs> the game's never lost the elegance. It's the clothes that have. A friend of mine calls it the avocado decade. It was almost a caricature of itself. While the late Payne Stewart and other players occasionally have paid homage to the past, today's golfing generation seems focused on colors that are bright and bold, with clothing that is far more athletic in design than at any time in the past. In the age of instant media, these millennials live their professional lives in far more public ways than their predecessors, while their clothing companies try to keep pace, creating quality and advanced products. And the decision of how to effectively showcase those products is critical. In 2012, at the age of 19, and midway through his sophomore year at Texas, Jordan Speed turned professional. Just weeks after that, Jordan made another major decision. He picked the partner he felt could help create a look to reflect his personal identity, both on the course and off. He's got it. First teenage winner since 1931. You gotta be yourself, you gotta find what works for you and who you wanna be portrayed as. And that's who you wanna align yourself with. He represents his family, himself very well, and I think he represents our brand well. At the age of 21, Jordan Spieth is very much involved in the process, from design to style, providing feedback and helping in decisions that reflect his optimum look and apparel technologies that allows him to perform. That's really incredible to be able to be a part of different strategies, different designs. And the best thing that could happen would be a fusion of technology and style. A year ago, Jordan Spieth finished second in his first appearance at the Masters. Months before the 2015 Masters, Spieth and Under Armour start to activate their strategy. A strategy that includes selecting Jordan's wardrobe for all four days of competition. It's funny, these kids are growing up and trying to emulate me, I guess, and you know, it's weird for me to talk about it like that, because I'm not far removed. Jordan Spieth is the latest in a long line of great players who will try to make his mark by winning in Augusta and capturing the game's most coveted prize. Yes! The Green Jacket. Today, the green jacket has become an iconic symbol of excellence. It is now as much a part of the Masters as the dogwoods, Georgia pines, and flowering azaleas. The green jacket is probably one of the most iconic pieces of clothing in history. If you really think about what it represents in sports, that is the greatest badge of honor anybody could probably wear. It's not only the green jacket but it's the personalities of bobby jones and clifford roberts and the place itself the masters is the only tournament where you'll never hear anybody talk about what size the purse is you know the players aren't playing for an amount of money they're playing for that jacket i think about the people who were capable who didn't win and you feel very very lucky to be alongside the greats of the game to have the green jacket sitting in my locker when i come on property um, is really, really special. It's very, very cool. It's a, it's a tremendous honor. You know, that sport coat will never go out of style. 
Because of the vision of Bobby Jones and Clifford Roberts, what modestly began as the Augusta National Invitation has become one of the most cherished and beloved events in the world. Throughout its journey, through changes in the game, the course, and the legends who battled for its title, from the green jacket to the magical roars that echo through the Georgia Pines, much to the delight of golf patrons everywhere, there is nothing quite like tournament week every spring in Augusta. The Masters has always had a feel and style all its own.